Good morning and welcome. I'm so glad that each of you are here. This is the, Chris, the Sunday before Christ's birth. And so I want to take a little bit of stress off of you. You know, everybody gets stressed during the holiday season because you want to purchase that perfect gift. Well, the only perfect gift that ever came was Jesus wrapped in that manger. So let's rejoice in that this week. Um, I guess these two people have come up here, so that must mean they're going to do announcements. So um, I'm going to ask first, do we have a birthday or an anniversary this week? Oh, man. Everybody standing up. <laughs> they didn't tell me this. Ah, I didn't get enough candy. Did you really have a birthday? I do. You do have a birthday. Okay. Thank you, guys. All right. Oh, man, there's Amen some. Jesus. Okay. Well, happy birthday. Eli has a birthday this week. Happy birthday. And Jay. His mama. Oh, Mama's birthday. Will you take that and give it to Mama? All right. Tell her happy birthday. We told her happy birthday. You didn't have a birthday, did you? No. Okay. Did you have? Oh, anniversary. I don't know what's there. No, that's a Twix. Oh. Uh, 17. Wow. Congratulations. Wow. Okay. So can you reach it there? Happy birthday. All right. So there were a lot of birthdays. You know, I had read not very long ago about December birthday people. They actually normally live longer than anyone else that's born in any other month. So there you go. I mean, for whatever that's worth, it was on Facebook, so it has to be real. You know? Huh. Okay. Well, as far as announcements go, this Wednesday is going to be Christmas, so we're not going to meet for Gifted Crafters. And the next week is New Year's, so we're not going to meet for Gifted Crafters. But believe me, the next Monday, I believe it's around the 8th. Is that when it is? Okay. We're going to get started because we'll be presenting our banquet in February and so we really want to make that special for each of you as you come and celebrate and we're going to change it up this year so y'all be looking for the announcements on that. Um, the only other thing I wanted to uh, say was that I have eight poinsettias up here. There's eight fret, not the two in the middle, the silk ones, but the other eight poinsettias. I'd like someone to take them home with them today and enjoy them. They still look beautiful. So if you'll see me after church, if you'd be willing to take a poinsettia and enjoy it the rest of the season. And which one of you would like to come first? Okay. Because I think we do have a children's story, so after you do the children's story, and uh, then Casey comes and he can pray and ask Miss Joanne to come up here. You know, this kind of offers a lot of power, so I have a few things I'd like to say to my daughter while I have the. <laughs> oh, well, at least she's sitting down to hear it. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank my mom for opening her house up yesterday for our cookie exchange. We had a lot of fun. They got to see her OCD and that's obsessive Christmas disorder. <laughs> but we had a lot of fun and as women sometimes that's all we need is the fellowship. Okay? But I'm up here to talk about, don't want y'all to forget that you get lost in the Christmas hustle and bustle this week. But next Friday, 10 a.m., we're gonna have our pack and pray. We're gonna pack our little gallon bags, hopefully for the next two months, for all the little kids that we help. What we did, because we were really concerned about them for two weeks not getting any food, we sent them double portion. So hopefully they'll spread it out and they'll have enough. But we're talking about kids that go to school on Monday and cry over a peanut butter sandwich because they've been hungry all weekend. So we've been trying to send those on Mondays and during the week also to help them out. So 10 a.m. on Friday, I'm going to have a little snack. We're going to have an assembly line going and we'll just pray over the bags as we get them all packed. Uh, 
I just wanted to kind of reiterate an announcement that you already had. Uh, Dennis Cole from Narrowgate Ministries has a crew of actors that are going to be putting on a presentation this afternoon at the heart of Berlin there on Becker and Main Street uh, next to City Hall. It's a presentation of the nativity story told through different characters in the nativity. So Mary will be one actor, for example. Uh, and I just wanted to pass that along. Three o'clock, it's probably about a, a 30 minute show. It's not a big long thing, uh, but it will be there outdoors. So you might wanna get your coat, but it's uh, through Dennis Cole's ministry. So if you're interested, come on and we'll have chairs for everybody to sit there and, and watch the show. Are there any other announcements before we pray? Miss Joanne's got a story. She's all mic'd up, ready to go. Let's pray. Father, we just come before you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this time that we get to come together. We even thank you today for this season that we remember you, Father. I pray for this whole worship service to just bring glory to you. I pray for Joanne's story to be a, a witness to children, to just show them your light and your love. But I also pray the same for our music program, for our worship time, that we can just glory in you, Father. And of course, for that sermon, to bring your word and that we hear what it is that you have prepared for us. But Father, I pray that your will be done, and I pray in your name, amen. Children, you're welcome to come. Anything? Okay. We bought e Evan and Zach and I bought each other presents. Oh, okay. Well, I tell you what, Miss Joanne didn't make a list because she's got so much stuff. She, her house is stuff. Let me ask you this question: Do you think Jesus makes a list? I you think don't. He does. What kind of list do you think he makes? All the people in the world to get to know him. Right. You know, I went. I look back in this old, old, old uh, cookbook. I found it in some books when I was going through some of my stuff. And and believe it or not, this old cookbook is from 1978, and it had a little poem in it that said, "Your task is to build a better world." God said. I answered. How? This world is such a large, vast place. Too complicated now. And I so small and useless am. There is so little I can do. But God in his great wisdom said, just build a better you. Isn't that neat? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could give Jesus that this coming year? Just build a better, what were some of the things we might do? Go to better us. Yeah. Be a little kinder. Yeah, help each other. Help each other. Pray more. Yeah. Read our scriptures more. Learn more about Jesus. Yeah. Just build a better us, huh? Yeah. And Jesus would love to have that gift this Christmas, wouldn't he? Yes. Okay. Wayne's going to come and pray for us now. Let's go to the Lord. Father, we thank you. What a wonderful, wonderful day you've given us. Thank you for the teaching from Joanne. Thank you for each person here, Father, for your love, your mercy, your grace. Thank you for your son, for all that he's done for us. Ask your blessing on the service, Lord. We pray that we glorify and honor you. Pray in Christ's name, Father. Amen. Amen. Yeah. 
Thank you for that special song. Beautiful. Good morning. Merry Christmas. Good morning, even. <laughs> Marilyn said that if you have that mic, it's powerful. But what she didn't say it was not just who has the mic, it's who has the mic last. <laughs> That's what counts. Ooh. There you go. Robbie's in charge then. Well, good morning and Merry Christmas again. We are, are here this morning to, to worship that Savior, like Ted was just singing, who is alive. Amen. I have a question for you today. What is it that is most important right now? What is the most important during the Christmas season? Now, if you, if you stop and think about it, some folks might fill that in and answer the question and say, got to get all my shopping done. That might be on some folks' list. You know, Walmart, Walmart's sitting there waiting to take your money, and, and some folks haven't taken advantage of that opportunity yet. Uh, another thing. Uh, you might want to get out and, and visit some folks, visit friends, might have uh, parties to get to, company Christmas parties, uh, family doing dinners. Those are important things that you got to keep in mind now during the season. Um, come in here might be important. You know we're going to have a Christmas Eve service, 5 o'clock Tuesday, right? See, that's where you're supposed to say yes. Yeah, fine. It's important. It's important. So... So maybe your Christmas important, you know, those things that are important at Christmas time aren't the busyness things of the season. Maybe the important things are, are a little bit more spiritual for you. Like coming to Christmas Eve, you're all, or coming to Christmas service, you're all here today. This is the Sunday before Christmas. So maybe that's something that's important to you. Tuesday night, like I said, we'll, we'll be meeting again Christmas Eve. Maybe that's important to you. Maybe you sit around with your family, your friends, and you read that nativity story, maybe that's important to you. Whatever it is that is important to you, whatever during this time that you think of as important, I got an answer to that question that came not from our opinion, not from me, not from what we may think is important, but from the Apostle Paul. Let me show you a verse. And if you've got your Bible handy, you can flip over there to Luke chapter 24, which is not really the most traditional place to, to turn to your Bible on a Christmas uh, last Sunday service. But go ahead and flip over to Luke 24. But that question of what is it that is most important, Paul answered for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in the first half there in chapter 15 verse 3, Paul says, I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Ooh, that might perk your ears up a little bit. What is it that was passed on to Paul that was not just significant, not just, well, you might need to know it, but he writes and he says, what was most important... What could that be that is most important that Paul needed to know? Well, he goes on and he says, Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said. Now we come together at Christmas time, and as important as Christmas is, and besides you know, the Walmart shopping and, and filling out your, your Christmas cards and getting those in the mail, as important as those things may be, the most important, according to Paul, the most important thing that we have to know is that Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He was raised on the third day. Now we come at Christmas time and we think of Jesus as that little baby placed in a manger in Bethlehem. 
But really, even more important than that, even more important than the Son of God coming to live among men on earth. And just imagine how important that statement was. The Son of God coming to live with men on earth. How? That's, that's pretty important, don't you think? But even of more importance than that is that that little baby didn't just come to tell us about God's love. He didn't just grow up and, and tell about how God loved us. The most important thing is that he showed us God's love by exactly what Paul wrote about. Jesus died on the cross for us. And even better than that, we have a hope because he was raised on the third day. So to honor Jesus, I'd like to, to take a, a little bit of turn from what traditionally is done at, at Christmas time and look at that resurrection. That's what's in Luke chapter 24. I have a few people that are, are going to help us read that. There, there's a, a big section there. So would my readers please come on up. And if we have Wayne's mic and, and the middle mic ready for them. You're welcome to, to turn in your Bible over to Luke chapter 24. It's the beginning of, of chapter 24 if you'd like to follow along. But I would invite you not to follow along today. You're welcome to it. But I would like you to hear God's word. Hear God's word speak to you through your ears and not so much your eyes this morning. Let's hear what God's word says. But very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. So they went in, but they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them, clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. Then the men asked, Why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He has risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee. That the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, and be crucified, and that he would rise again on the third day. Then they remembered that he had said this. So they rushed back from the tomb to tell his eleven disciples and everyone else what had happened. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and several other women who told the apostles what had happened. But the story sounded like nonsense to the men, so they didn't believe it. However, Peter jumped up and ran to the tomb to look. Stooping, he peered in and saw the empty linen wrappings. Then he went home again. Wondering what had happened. Thank you. Now I want to point out something. In those verses, those 12 verses in Luke chapter 24, did you notice exactly what Paul said? Is what those angels told the ladies at the tomb that they came back to report to the disciples. That yes, Christ had died. They all knew that. But that the tomb was empty. And he didn't just announce, hey, the tomb was empty. He reminded them that Jesus had told them about that ahead of time. Predicted his own death, predicted his own resurrection. Yet they did not understand it until at this point, when the women show up to the disciples, they hear the news. And that's really the focus of today's sermon. I want to look, just like Ted's song this morning, at how the disciples took the news. Particularly Peter. How Peter took the news that the tomb was empty. Now, we just got to hear Luke's account of this conversation and this act of the disciples hearing about that. But John goes on and he has his own account. And he adds a little bit of detail that Luke is not. So in John chapter 20, starting in verse 3, Peter and the other disciples started out for the tomb. Now, are you all familiar with who the other disciple is here? 
This is John's gospel, and John is famous for writing about himself in the third person when he wrote his gospel. He didn't say, I. He didn't insert the pronoun that we use today, I, when we talk about ourselves. He used the third person, so when he was referring to the other disciple, that's John himself. So you could actually say, Peter and John started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple, now remember who that is, as John, but John outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived. So by the way, you know who the fastest disciples are, right? <laughs> Simon Peter arrived, and he went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there. While the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first, that's John, John also went in, and he saw and believed. For until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said, Jesus must rise from the dead. Peter and John heard about the empty tomb from the women. They run out to see for themselves what they reported. They arrive. John, of course, is the fastest, but he arrives at the entrance to the tomb, but he's not the first to go in. Who is the first that went into the tomb to see the emptiness of the tomb? Peter. There is some significance to why John arrives first, yet it was Peter who went into the tomb. Why would it have been Peter? Well, I have a clue for you. During the Last Supper... In Luke chapter 22, a little bit before this account that we were just reading with Luke 24, during the last summer, there's a conversation between Jesus and Peter. Jesus tells him, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Now let's stop for a minute right there. Jesus is telling Simon, remember, all the disciples are here at the Last Supper, and he purposefully pulls out Simon to address him. This is Peter, and he says, I have prayed specifically for you. Your faith may not fail, but yet there's a clue there. He says, and when you turn back, strengthen your brothers. Well, if Jesus is praying for his faith not to fail, how is it possible that Peter would need to turn back? Well, Jesus goes on in, in this conversation to kind of explain that. He replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Peter's a very gung-ho kind of guy. Very energetic. But watch what Jesus says back. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Jesus was praying for Peter's faith. He knew that it was going to be tested that night. That at Jesus' arrest, at Jesus' many trials, Peter would deny knowing Jesus three separate times. And not just that he would deny Jesus. But a crow, or a rooster would crow after that third time and remind him of Jesus' words. How difficult is that to hear? From Peter's point of view, he denied it then. That can't be. He says, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. That was before Jesus was arrested. 
in the middle of the night, in the middle of, of Pilate's courtyard, with the soldiers beating Jesus, and people questioning, aren't you one of them? Three separate times, Peter says no. Don't know him. I'm not that guy. Not me. When John gets to the tomb first, he hesitates to go in. Peter follows behind him. He does not stop. He does not stay with John. He goes on into the tomb. But you've got to understand, in Jewish law, that was a very, very unclean kind of thing to do. You do not touch dead bodies, nor anything that itself has touched a dead body. And here he is, rushing into the tomb, the center of everything unclean. What could possibly have motivated him more than John to head into the tomb to see what was going on. I think it's here. He wanted forgiveness. He wanted to know that that denial that he had made three separate times could be forgiven. Well, how does that work out for Peter? The tomb is empty. There's no Jesus, but yet he has some hope, knowing that what the ladies had told them, what the angels had reported to them, is true. When he does finally catch up to Jesus later, just as Ted was singing, there is a conversation. There on the shores of Galilee, the disciples had gone out fishing. They were in their boats, and they had just come back to shore early in the morning, and they found Jesus there preparing breakfast for them. And we catch up to this conversation once again in John. John is a good uh, account, a very detailed conversation. John chapter 21 verse 15 tells us what finally transpired when Peter got to talk to Jesus. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Now those of you that have read your gospel stories, how many times did this exact conversation happen between Jesus and Peter? Three times. Why three times? Why would Jesus three times ask the exact same question, Do you love me? Because it matches the three times that he denied him. You see, Peter had repented. Remember, Jesus prayed for his faith that night at the Last Supper. He told him, I'm praying that your faith remains strong because you will have, to, or when it is time to turn back, I want you to strengthen your brothers. He knew what was going to happen. Peter, of course, did not understand. But yet, Peter did turn back. He rushed into that tomb hoping that Jesus was alive so that this whole wrong that he had committed against Jesus denying him could be forgiven. And here Jesus, by asking him this question three separate times after breakfast, is showing that he is forgiven. Peter had turned away from Jesus during that night of the trial and now at the tomb after the resurrection, he turns back to Jesus and Jesus forgives him. There's something important there for us. Peter was desperate. He knew that he had wronged Jesus. He knew that if Jesus were dead, there was no forgiveness to be found. That night of the trial could not be taken back if Jesus was dead. How can you ask a dead man to forgive you? It doesn't work. 
he would have to live with that the rest of his life. Now, you might have regrets of things that you've done or, or, or opportunities that you missed in your life. Try putting yourself in Peter's shoes that night and knowing what you had done to Jesus and thinking that that could never be fixed until the women show up and report that the tomb is empty and your hope beyond all hope, beyond all reason, is that what they said is true, that Jesus is alive. So you rush into that tomb wanting forgiveness. Well, he got forgiveness there on the shores of Galilee. But that forgiveness, I think, is important. I, I started with the sermon today of asking you a question, what is it that is most important? According to Paul, it's that resurrection. It's Jesus dying for us, rising again. We come on a Christmas Sunday. We're all wearing our, our Christmas reds or, or greens. We, we got decorations in the house. We got lights up. We got presents. We have all those things that, that keep us busy at Christmas. But more so than all of those things, even more so than the nativity itself, even more important than God coming to us, is what Peter learned at the empty tomb and what he heard on the shores of Galilee. Jesus is not dead. Jesus is alive. And even better than that, you are forgiven. There is no thing more important than those. As important as Christmas is, not to say Christmas is not, but as important as Christmas is, nothing comes close to Jesus' death for us and that promise that we have of the resurrection because we are forgiven by that death. It took Peter literally learning firsthand what Jesus for three years had tried to teach. He told the disciples that he was going to die. He told them that he was going to rise on the third day. They didn't understand it. The angels tried telling the women, remember what he had told you? But the whole complete picture does not come into focus for Peter until he is there with Jesus. So that's where we come in. That forgiveness that Peter learned about, this greatest, most important thing, is not just for Peter. It's for each of us. We may not have denied Jesus in the middle of a trial three times like Peter did, but we've all got our wrongs of, of whatever it may be. We've done our... our, our our wrongs, the Sunday school word for that, of course, our sin. But whatever our wrong is, whatever our sin is, Jesus' death forgives all of it. All of it. Peter rushed into the tomb, hoping beyond hope that he had a chance for forgiveness. Do we rush to Jesus hoping beyond hope for our forgiveness for our wrongs? I think sometimes we, we, we deny Jesus because we, for various reasons, don't come to him for that forgiveness. We don't turn our lives over to him. We don't accept all these things that we've now been looking at all year long for a year we've been looking at the gospel of Luke and what Jesus did what Jesus said what Jesus prophesied and fulfilled sometimes we deny Jesus that way but yet the same opportunity that Peter had we all have we just have to rush to Jesus like he did 
And Jesus will forgive us. We just got to turn. Just like that, we were talking about the thief on the cross. We have to turn to Jesus. Don't deny Jesus. Deny all the wrong that we did. Turn away from it. Get away from that and turn to Jesus. That is the most important thing to know at Christmas time. As cute as your nativity sets may be, as bright as your lights are, as warm as your house may be with friends and family, nothing comes close to this forgiveness. And it's proven true by the empty tomb in Jesus' resurrection. You can't deny it. It happened. But the question is, is how do you respond to it? Do you rush or do you deny? So I'm going to leave you with that this morning. Uh, Ted, would you bring up our worship team? Why don't you all stand with me?